Hi, how's everybody doing this morning? Everyone get a snack? Everybody take care of their needs? Yeah, um, there's nothing worse than like speaking to a room full of um, hungry people who have to pee. So I'm um, really excited that I was able to go um, right after the break. Um, and also, I, I just wanna say thank you, particularly to uh, Sunu and Robin um, for the invitation and for all the hard work it took to get me here physically um, and mentally. Um, and to be the person uh, with the fortunate, unfortunate job of uh, of being the buzzkill, uh, which is often the, the position I get in um, when I'm talking about the book to audiences who are very excited about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so uh, I have limited time. I'm, I'm just gonna try to do a couple of things. Um, and, but first I wanna sort of start uh, with a, a basic provocation, um, perhaps. Um, which is, I, I want to argue, I want to begin by arguing that poverty is not an illness um, or a pathology. Um, in fact, it's a majority condition. 51% uh, of us in the United States will be below the poverty line at some point between the ages of 20 and 64. And a full two-thirds of us will access means-tested public assistance. So that's straight welfare. That's cash assistance, home heating assistance, food stamps. Um, so this is not a, a condition that is an aberration within the United States. In fact, it's the majority condition. And so thinking of poverty as an illness is a bit like thinking of pregnancy as an illness. Um, and the problem with that is that it creates staggering inequalities in how normal conditions are treated. Um, and it also creates, can create a terrible experience of childbirth, which is unnecessary. Um, so, in fact, I, one of the things I argue in the book is that this very orientation, this orientation towards diagnosing the poor um, or diagnosing people who are experiencing exploitation and discrimination is central to what I call in the book the digital poorhouse, which is a sort of invisible electronic means of profiling, classifying, policing, and punishing poor and working class people. So I don't do medicine, I just be very direct about that. Um, but I do think I can be useful here in a couple of ways, um, in some specific ways. Um, the first is that what I wanna do is bring the voices of people who are already targets of the kinds of systems we're talking about and proposing today um, from their point of view as they experience them. And I think that's really important for two reasons. One is when we talk about the sort of our newest, sexiest technological tools, we have a tendency to talk about them in the abstract um, as, as if they sort of arrive from nowhere, like the monolith in 2001, A Space Odyssey, right? And that they land on like a blank ground where nothing has happened before, and then they just have their own internal momentum that creates change or does not. Um, in fact, it's not the way technology works at all. It comes out of society and culture. It then affects society and culture. Um, and the other way that we tend to talk about our newest and most exciting technologies is very future focused, right? We talk about what might happen with these technologies in the future, rather than um, talking to the folks who are actually experiencing the effects of very similar technologies right now in their day-to-day -day material lives. So what I wanna do today in the limited time that I have is share two stories that I tell in the book um, and specifically to share the voices of the people who took really incredible risks going on record, talking about their experiences with these tools in the public assistance system, right? So these are folks who are receiving public assistance, who are receiving homeless services, or who are being investigated by child protective services. They took extraordinary risk um, to themselves and to their family talking to me, and so I think it's really important that I make sure their, their voices are in the room. Um, and then I'm gonna, depending on time, I'm gonna sort of draw out three big lessons that I think might be um, interesting and useful for those of us who are thinking about health and wellness. And um, then I have a couple of questions that we might consider asking um, ourselves as we move towards AI and equity in medicine. Um, so I wanna tell two stories specifically. Let's see if I can get this to work, yay. This is a great slide, but we're not talking about it today. Um, 
So um, the, the first story I want to tell is a story about uh, the state of Indiana, where in uh, 2006, then Governor Mitch Daniels signed what was eventually a $1.34 billion contract with a consortium of high-tech companies, among them IBM and ACS, to automate all of the eligibility processes for the welfare programs in the state. Um, so that is um, Medicaid, cash assistance, or TANF, and what at the time was called food stamps is now called SNAP. Um, basically how this system worked is they moved 1,500 local caseworkers into privatized, regionalized call centers and encouraged folks who were applying for social assistance to apply online rather than in person in their local um, county uh, welfare offices. Um, from the caseworker's point of view, it um, really hampered their ability to go out of their way to help someone get the benefits that they knew they were el eligible for and deserved. From the recipient's point of view, um, every time you called the call center, you spoke to a new caseworker. There was nobody who knew your story from the beginning to the end. And if a mistake was made, um, then all of the sort of pressure of finding a solution fell on you, fell on your shoulders, fell on the shoulders of the most vulnerable people in the state. Um, the upshot of this is uh, in the, the three years of this experiment, uh, they denied a million applications for public assistance, which is a 54% increase from the three years before the experiment. And I just want to share the story. Victor, you actually introduced Omega for me, so I appreciate it. I just want to share one of those stories with you. I want to share the story of Omega Young of Evansville, Indiana. So in the fall of 2008, Omega Young of Evansville missed an appointment to recertify for Medicaid because she was in the hospital suffering from terminal cancer. The cancer that began in her ovaries had spread to her kidneys, breast, and liver. Her chemotherapy left her weak and emaciated. Young, a round-faced, umber-skinned mother of two grown sons, struggled to meet the new system's requirements. She called her county help center to let them know she was hospitalized and couldn't make the phone appointment they had set up for her to recertify for her benefits. But her Medicaid and her food st stamps were still cut off for this catch-all reason for most of these denials, which was called failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility. Because she lost her benefits, Young was unable to afford her medications. She lost her food stamps. She struggled to pay her rent. She lost access to free transportation to medical appointments. And Omega Young died on March 1, 2009. The next day, on March 2nd, she won an appeal for wrongful termination of her benefits, and all of her benefits were restored. OK. So that's Indiana. Um, I'm going to not talk about the homeless registry in Los Angeles, um, though I think it's a really important and interesting story, um, because I want to get more quickly to something that's more in the domain of machine learning. Um, and one of the stories I tell in the book is the story of a tool called the Allegheny Family Screening Tool um, in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, which is where Pittsburgh is. Um, and Mark, thank you for showing a map of Allegheny County. Um, those are the neighborhoods I worked in were all the neighborhoods that were dark red on that map. So Rankin, Duquesne, um, Liberty. Um, so the Allegheny Family Screening Tool is built on top of a really large data warehouse that the county, the Department of Human Services of Allegheny County has been building since about 1999. The data warehouse currently holds a billion records, um, more than 800 for every single individual in Allegheny County. Um, but of course, it doesn't collect information on everyone in Allegheny County equally. In fact, it really only collects information on people who are accessing public services. Right? So if you have a problem with um, a, medical a medical condition or an, uh, an addiction and you can get, you have private health insurance so you can get private, su private support for that, you don't end up in the data warehouse. Um, if you need support with childcare for your family and you can pay a babysitter or you can get an au pair um, and you don't have to rely on the county for childcare support, you don't end up in the data warehouse. Now, the reason that that matters is this tool that is supposed to be able to predict how risky your family is to your children is built on that data. So it's built on a deeply flawed data set that confuses parenting while poor with poor parenting. And that has monumental consequences for the quality of the predictions of the system. So it's not just that 
um, poor and working folks won't have access to these new sexy tools. It is that the inequalities in the way that we gather information about families in this country um, actually will profoundly affect the ability of, of those systems to, to predict any of the things they want to predict at all, right? So the parents I spoke to in Allegheny County are deeply concerned about this model's problems with, um, I always get these mixed up, so it takes me a minute to think, think it through, false positives. Um, so false positives basically just mean seeing a problem where no problem actually exists, right? So of course that's what parents are going to be concerned about. They're concerned that because their communities are over surveilled, this tool is going to rank them as riskier to their children, and that will result in um, intervention by child protective services, um, which in some cases can be good and can offer people resources. But in all cases, even when you're having a positive experience of being offered resources, opens your family up to state scrutiny that can end in your children being removed and put into foster care. So parents are very concerned about false positives. But I also spent a day in the um, intake call screening office where caseworkers um, decide which cases go to a full investigation. And their concern was actually around false negatives, which was not seeing harm where harm might be occurring. And the reason they're concerned about false negatives is because the data warehouse only collects information on poor and working class families, um, then it actually doesn't capture any of the factors that might be contributing to abuse and neglect in middle class, professional middle class, and owning class families. So we may be missing forms of abuse and neglect that the model is unable to predict. And I just want you to hear from one family in, in Allegheny County, and then I'm happy to talk um, at, at much more length about that system. Um, it's actually an interesting one to get into the technical weeds on, but I'll spare you that for now. Um, so in Allegheny County, I talked to Angel Shepard and Patrick Grebe, um, and I met them at the Duquesne Family Support Center, which is like a community hub where families who are involved with uh, the child welfare system sort of attend programs and do peer support. Um, so Angel and Patrick didn't stand out to me right away because their experience is so utterly average, so characteristic of the routine, mundane indignities experienced by the white working class. So they've struggled with low-wage, dangerous work, poor quality public schools, predatory online education, poor health, and community violence. Um, but throughout it all, they remain really creative, involved parents. Um, so they're ca helping care for two um, young girls, uh, Angel's daughter, Harriet, and Patrick's daughter's daughter, Desiree. The two girls are roughly the same age, so they bicker a lot. And, um, and Patrick is just like a big old square, rectangular, enormous man uh, who in the book I call sort of like a Buddhist ex-biker. He has like very, a lot of elaborate facial hair and he's a very large guy. Um, and when the two girls bicker, they put him in one of his shirts, which they call the get-along shirt. And the get-along shirt, uh, what, what happens in the get-along shirt is each girl has to put one arm through the armhole, one of the armholes, and the other arm around the waist of the other girl, and they have to stay in the get-along. They button it up, and they have to stay in the get-along sh shirt and, until they stop fighting, um, even if they have to go to the bathroom, Patrick told me. He says that's what, that's what always works. Um, so despite being really engaged parents, um, Angel and Patrick have racked up a lifetime of interactions with Children, Youth, and Family Services. Patrick was investigated for medical neglect in the early 2000s because he was unable to afford his daughter Tabitha's antibiotic prescription after an emergency room visit. When Harriet was five, someone phoned in a string of reports to the child abuse and neglect hotline, and this sort of anonymous tipster explained that Harriet was running around the neighborhood unsupervised, down the block teasing a dog, wasn't being properly clothed, fed, or bathed, that she wasn't getting needed medication. And for each call, I always forget to do my slides, sorry. Um, for each call, um, an investigator came to the house, interviewed Harriet and Tabitha, Angel and Patrick, looked in all the cupboards and under all the beds, and requested access to the family's medical records. And then each time, finding no evidence of maltreatment, they closed the case. So each of these interactions was entered into the family's case file, which is held in the integrated data warehouse, which powers the Allegheny family screening tool. So Patrick and Angel really live in the state of sort of constant low-grade terror that another call on their family um, will mean that the algorithm is run and their daughter or granddaughter will be targeted for investigation and possibly for removal to foster care. So Angel said to me, you feel like a prisoner. 
you feel trapped. It's like no matter what you do, it's not good enough for them. My daughter is now nine, and I'm still afraid that they're going to come up one day, see her out by herself, pick her up, and say, you can't have her anymore. So I want to take just a couple of minutes to sort of pull a couple of big lessons that might be applicable um, to health and wellness uh, out of these stories. Um, so the first is that all of these tools, I talked a lot, I did more than 105 interviews um, for this book. I started from the point of view of folks who were targets of these systems, but I also talked to designers and administrators and data scientists and economists and lots of different folks. And of all the folks who are on the design side of these tools, they share a common perspective, which is that these tools are necessary, sometimes regrettably necessary, but necessary tools for doing triage, for deciding who needs help immediately and who can wait. Um, and one of the things I want to point out is the decision to triage is a political choice. In fact, there is no natural disaster that is causing poverty in the United States. It is policy, um, and it is a system of structural exploitation that is causing poverty in the United States, and there's nothing natural or inevitable about it. Um, so when you're talking about these tools being um, implemented in conditions of austerity, I believe we need to be incredibly careful because too often they are um, just, they, they're used to justify um, cost cutting in programs that are already starving. Second, um, we often think about these tools as being some more, somehow more neutral or objective than human beings. And I think the more subtle and in some ways more powerful argument in favor of these tools is limiting individual bias and discrimination. But that argument only holds if the technology tools aren't also biased and don't also discriminate. Um, and that is not at least the, the case in the tools that I looked at for automating inequality. Um, so there is a deep social programming to many of these tools that understand social problems in very specific ways. For example, understanding poverty as an illness that shape the way um, the to tools understand the problems and the universe of possible solutions. Um, it's also really important to point out that when we talk about removing human discretion, um, I have a very smart political scientist friend named Joe Sauce who says uh, discretion is like energy. It's um, neither created nor destroyed, it's simply moved. Um, so actually when we talk about removing discretion from frontline workers, whether they're nurse or nurses or caseworkers, we're actually not removing that discretion from the system, we're just moving it somewhere else. So in the case of the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, we're removing discretion from the frontline call screeners, but we're giving it to the economists and the data scientists who are building the tool. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, there's a labor issue there. There's also a racial and class issue there because the frontline of these systems tends to be the most female, the most um, uh, racially diverse, um, and the most working class part of the workforce. And, and certainly, um, for all their wonders, data scientists and economists are not a particularly diverse bunch. Um, and finally, I think one of the things that, one of the things that most concerns me about these systems um, is the way they can act as empathy overrides. So um, I believe that part of the reason we're creating this, these systems is because we're facing some of the most perilous structural problems that the country has ever, um, has, has ever uh, addressed, has ever confronted. Um, and I, I don't want to be the frontline caseworker in Los Angeles County who's making a decision between the 58,000 unhoused people in Los Angeles County and the handful of resources they have to offer them, right? That is an incredibly hard job. What we're doing, though, is outsourcing that incredibly difficult uncomfortable decision to a computer in a way that might relieve us of our duty to deal with the larger problems, right? So I believe at their worst that these systems can act as empathy overrides, allowing us to escape um, the, the, some of the root causes for the problems um, that these tools are sp supposed to um, simply predict in this neutral and objective way. Um, so let me talk very briefly, how am I doing on time? Do I have, am I over? I'm just about over. Two minutes? I got two minutes. So uh, solutions. Let's talk about solutions really quick. So I think, um, also I love this slide, but we're not going um, to use it except for to mention 
what I think is the really important point here, which is that um, intentions don't matter as much as impacts matter, right? And that really good intentions can lead to terrible outcomes for people. Um, and, and I think that's incredibly important um, to mention. But let's spend a little time with solutions. Um, so first solution is a set of really big picture solutions. Um, I believe we need to change the story around poverty in the United States, like I began uh, the talk with, by uh, shifting um, from seeing poverty as a pathology to seeing poverty as a majority condition, and that is a structural condition of exploitation, um, and addressing the root causes um, of the, the harms um, that that causes in our communities. Um, hopefully moving away from this idea that poverty is a problem of a pathological minority, can lead us to political solutions that are less about diagnosing what's wrong with you because you're poor and more about um, helping everyone meet their basic human needs. Um, so universal floors rather than moral thermometers, I believe is the kind of tools we need to be building. Um, and finally, the technology is not gonna just sort of stop in the meantime as we do this really difficult cultural and political work. So one of the things that I found is really useful for folks is uh, to help us start thinking more clearly about what kinds of questions we should be asking when we're looking at automation and inequity. Um, what most progressive critics of algorithmic decision making where they tend to land is around three things, transparency, accountability, and sometimes participatory or user-centered design. These are all incredibly important things, but for me, these are step zero, right? These are like the, the, the base, basement level kinds of things we should be expecting from technologies that are making life or death decisions in a democracy. That's our absolute base. So where do we go from there? Assuming accountability, transparency, and some kind of user-centered design, where do we go from there? One question I, I try to encourage people always to ask is, is the use of analytics um, accompanied by an increase in resources? Or is it um, under conditions of trying to find cost savings? Um, and this is incredibly, I'll use this one example to, to close up, and then we can talk more about this later. Um, so a great example that gets talked about a lot is about um, a Georgia State University has recently moved to doing uh, predictive analytics in their um, uh, academic advising. Um, and this story has been widely written about as a huge success of predictive analytics. So they, they have had incredible success raising their retention rates for their mostly working class, mostly first generation, mostly students of color, student body at Georgia State, which is incredibly great. The thing that's interesting is that the story always gets talked about as a, as a, a success story of predictive analytics. Um, in 2012, when they um, introduced the predictive analytics, um, they also um, went from doing 1,000 advising appointments a year to 52,000 advising appointments a year. They hired 42 new advisors. So in fact, the story here, the buried lead, is that um, massive, investment in real problem solves problem. Not predictive analytics solves problem, right? Predictive analytics often also probably really helped. It might have helped them figure out where to use those resources in the best, most efficient way. But the reality is they're working with 50 times the resources, right? So one place where you might be really cautious is when people talk about implementing one of these tools under conditions of austerity, under conditions of trying to create cost efficiencies. Um, I think that's always, um, that can be incredibly dangerous. Again, lots of more things to talk about, but I'm way over time. Um, so I just wanna say thank you for your attention. I'm super happy to talk, talk to address your questions um, as we move into the conversation. Um, and thanks, Margaret. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.